And welcome back to the Bible, the day 91, Faith, Healing, and Heritage. Today's readings will come out of Psalms 40, verses 1 through 9. And Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 40 through Luke chapter 9, verse 9. And we'll close out with a reading from Numbers chapter 31, starting in verse 25, and end in Numbers chapter 32, and end in verse 42. And before we get into this, let's start out with a really quick opening prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we're going to ask the Lord. And we're going to ask him to shine into our hearts the lovely master, the pure light of your divine knowledge. And note up the eyes of our mind that, that we may understand your teachings in the scripture. Help us to apply what we learn so that you're having conquered some of desires. We may pursue the spiritual way of life, thinking and doing all the things that are pleasing to you. Your Christ, your God, your life. And to you we give glory. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, now and forever, the sages. Lord is our shepherd. All right, good day. Welcome back. So great is his faithfulness. Indeed, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Christ is truly in our midst. The true definition of minister is to serve someone else's will. It's my pleasure to bring you all God's word each and every day. So I'm going to get the screen shared over. We're going to jump right into this. And I have put together a kind of an introduction into Psalms that's kind of inspired by ancient commentaries, such as the commentaries of St. John Christensen, St. John Cassian, St. Ambrose of Milan, and others. Right? So I'm going to get the screen shared over, and we're going to look at the Psalms from the Sispuagin, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which was translated somewhere, I think, in the 3rd or 4th century B.C., it's before Christ, done by, I think it was, 70 or 72 Jewish scholars. All right, so here we go. So the LSX. So just kind of listen a little bit to what I put together, and then we'll get into the study. So here, here we go. Psalms 40, verses 1 through 9. So the 40th Psalm, right, following the 39th, is a testament to the transmitted power of prayer. David, who is the psalmist, serves as a beacon of hope and a type of new people in Christ. And this psalm, the pit represents the depths of evil, and the rock symbolizes Christ, the solid foundation upon which our faith is built. He is the one who has come to save us, answering our prayers and lifting us up from the depths. We sing the new song of those renewed, celebrating God's favor, not to manipulate him, but to praise him. God grants righteousness as a gift of grace to the believers. Great are the wonders of divine providence. Christ offered himself as a voluntary sacrifice, fulfilling Old Testament types. The book prophesies, prophesies in Christ refers to the Psalms, the law, and the prophets. The entire scripture. Our sacrifice is prefigured in him. He is the true sacrifice offered according to his will and the fathers for our sake. The message of grace has been declared and the church worldwide responds in worship. As believers, we have a crucial role in spreading the message of Christ's sacrifice in grace, maintaining a faithful and full witness throughout the world and proclaiming righteousness imputed by grace. The great congregation includes all who have believed in Israel, both past and present. In Christ's mercy and truth meet, guiding us by love and fear. Though we are all imperfect, we have nothing, we have nothing of our own, and we all depend on Christ. We are entirely in his care. Name the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. So let's take a look. So I start by reading here. So it starts out by saying, for the end, a psalm of David. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he attended to me and hearkened to my supplication. And he brought me up out of the pit of misery and from the merry clay and set my feet on a rock and ordered my goings aright. And he put a new song into my mouth, even a hymn to our God. Many shall see it in fear, and he shall hope in the Lord. Blessed is the man whose hope is in the name of the Lord, and who has not regarded vanities and false frenzies. O Lord, my God, you have multiplied your wonderful works and your thoughts. There is none who shall be likened to you. I declare and spoken of them. They exceeded number. Sacrifice and offering you would not, but a body you have prepared me. Whole burnt offering and sacrifice for sin. You did not require. Then I said, behold, I come in the volume of the book 
it is written concerning me. I desire to do your will, oh my God, and your law in the midst of mine. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Behold, I will not refra refrain my lips. O oh Lord, you know my righteousness. Name the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. Beautiful. So Psalms 39 or 40, right? It's a profound prophecy of Christ's incarnation. As referenced in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 through 7. And it says, therefore, when he came into this world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me and burn offerings and sacrifice for sin. You have no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book is written to me to do your will. Oh, God, it's right there in Psalms 40. Right? So it's Christ. Right? It's beautiful. It's just beautiful. man. It's beautiful. Let's talk a little bit about this. So in this Psalms, Christ's assumption of a mortal body, which we saw in verse 6. Let me go back, right? So in verse 6, what does it say? It says, sacrifice and offering you would not, but a body you have prepared. Whole burnt offering, sacrifice for sin you did not require. It's highlighted, right? So the mortal body is being highlighted, improvising, is taking on a rational soul and a body subject to death and decay. Described as what a miserable pit which was in verse two, right? So it's a miserable pit, it's a pit of misery. This prophetic insight into Christ's coming, it's a testament to the divine wisdom and foresight embedded in the Psalms, beautiful. By his death in the body, Christ destroyed death and through his resurrection, he overcame the decay that binds man's bodies in the grave. This, victor this victory symbolizes being brought up and set upon a rock, which is also in verse two. Right? Remember what I said in that introduction. Christ's ability to accomplish this is rooted in his in the two wills present in his one person. He willed. What is that? Go to verse eight. He willed. I desire to do your will. So he will. By his human will and energy, his unity with God the Father, because he is in one essence with him, as stated in the creed. Throw there a means of his two wills and energies, Christ destroyed death and decay. This triumph has given the church a new song right there in verse three. Who's the new song? The church. And he put a new song in my mouth, even a hymn to our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall hope in the Lord. Beautiful. Celebrating what the victory of our death, the promise of resurrection. The psalm thus underscores the significance of Christ's dual nature and his role in salvation. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Let's move on now to Luke. So starting right here in verse 40, a girl restored to life and a woman healed. So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jarius, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter about 12 years of age and she was dying but he went to the multitude but as he went the multitude thronged him now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years who had spent all her livelihood on physicians could not be healed by any came from behind and touched the board of his garment and immediately her flow of blood stopped and jesus said who touched me and when all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitude is strong and press you. And you say, who touched me? But Jesus said, somebody touched me for I perceived the power going out from me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Do not be afraid. Only believe, and she will be made well. When he came to the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John, and the father and the mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her, but he said, Do not weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. And they, and they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead but he put them outside took her by the hand and called saying little girl arise 
Then her spirit returned and she arose immediately. And he commanded that she be given something to eat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Sending out the 12, chapter 9. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all the demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, take nothing for the journey, neither staffs, nor bags, nor bread, nor money. Do not, do not have two... Do not have two tunics in peace. Whatever, whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And whoever will not receive you, when you go out from the city, shake the very dust from your feet as a testimony against them. So they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Herod seeks to see Jesus. Now Herod the Tichar heard of all that was done by him. And he was perplexed because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead. By some that Elijah had appeared. By others that one of the old prophets had risen again. Herod said, John, I have beheaded. But who is this of whom I hear such things? So he sought to see him. Like the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we break this down. All right. Beautiful reading. So it starts out, right? So the healing of Jarius died. And the woman with a bleeding issue, right? So here's a comparative analysis. Jarius' daughter, Luke, mentions that Jarius' daughter is 12. The woman with bleeding, Luke also notes that the woman had her bleeding issue for 12 years. Cultural context. The Jews could not come into contact with blood. That was according to Le Leviticus chapter 25, which, which makes the woman's action of touching Jesus significant and very bold. She has strong faith. In, Ma in Matthew chapter 9, let's take a look at that real quick. Let's take a different look at what Matthew says, right? So this is a comparative analysis this evening, today. Verses 18 through 26, right? A girl restored life, a woman healed. While well, he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hands on her, and she will live. So Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for twelve years came behind and touched the hem of his garment. For, he said, for she said to herself, If only I may touch his garment, I should be made well. But Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. When Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing, he said to them, make room for the girls not dead but sleeping. And they, and they ridiculed him. But when the crowd was put outside, he went and took her by the hand. And the girl arose. And the report of this went out. Went, went out. Went into all, all that land. Okay. All right. So there, Jairus' daughter account is shorter and does not tell us the age of Jairus' daughter. The woman with the bleeding, the woman woman's healing is briefly mentioned without detailing the length of her illness, right? I think it says so for 12 years. I'm pretty sure it did. You know, it did mention she had it for 12 years, right? It didn't mention the little girl's age. Well, we'll look at Mark's account now. All right, so Mark, Mark, was it five, verse 21 through 43? It's a little bit longer. All right, here we go. And now when Jesus crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jarius by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. And begged him earnestly, saying, my, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now a certain woman who had a flow of blood 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians, she had spent all that she had was no better, but rather was worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came, beh came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately the fountain of blood was dried up, and she, and she felt in her body, and she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus immediately knowing 
in himself that the power had gone out of him, turned around the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? The disciples said to him, you see the mold who throng you and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. They came to the house, the ruler of the synagogue, and he saw a tumult. And those who wept and wailed loudly. And he came in and he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when he put them all outside, he took the father and mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was laying. He took the child by the hand and said to her, Tell him that come in. Which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl rose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement but he commanded them strictly that no one should know it and he and said that something should be given her to eat so jarley's so jarius daughter there so mark like luke includes the girl as being 12 years of age the woman with the bleeding mark also highlights the 12 year old duration of her condition improvising the chronic nature of her suffering the connection between jarius daughter and the woman the number 12 connects the girl and the woman symbolizing completeness in the nation of Israel. The girl has lived for 12 years and the woman has suffered for 12 years, showing a parallel in their experience with life and suffering. It was also to strengthen the faith of both of them, giving them both hope. When he called, let's go back to scripture, right? So when he tells your daughter, right? Remember, daughter, your faith has made you well. He was doing that to help Jarius. Right? Because Jari, his daughter, right? But they, he knew they were about to come to tell him that his daughter had died. But he wanted Jari to have hope. And he healed a woman with this issue that she had it for 12 years. So by calling her daughter, he strengthens the faith of Jari, knowing that his daughter's going to be okay. Let's look at verses 43 and 44. And it says, Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years who had spent all her livelihood in physicians could not be healed by any came from behind and touched the border of his garment. Immediately, her flow of blood stopped. So the woman's act of touching Jesus, despite Jewish laws against contact with blood, if you go to Leviticus chapter 25, it shows her desperation and her faith, right? I would do the same thing. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitude strong impress you, and you say, who touched me? Jesus' question highlights the significance of personal faith, which is connecting to Matthew, Matthew 23, verse 17. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that sacrifices the gold where understanding and recognition of faith are improvised we go back to let's look at verses 47 through 56 all right starting at 47 all right so there the woman confesses in jesus what affirms her faith as a means of what healing the news of the girl's death comes but jesus encouraged jarius to what have faith Jesus takes only a few disciples and the girl's parents to witness the miracle, improvising his intimacy and sacredness. Let me also point out, when Jesus tells the people that she's only asleep, there's a reason he's doing that, right? Because they, were, they did not go out and say that his daughter was raised right away. There was a reason for that. The reason why Jesus said that she's sleeping. That's why he only took a handful of people with him in there. At that time, they didn't want news like that to spread. So, in a way, he was saying she's sleeping, right? So, when she would be seen alive, it was as if the people had made a mistake that she wasn't dead, if that kind of makes sense. There's a reason he said that she was sleeping, right? They didn't want news like that to get out quite yet. 
So then we see Jesus raise the girl, showcasing his power over death and foreshadowing his own resurrection. Beautiful. And as we transition to Luke chapter 9, right? So Luke chapter 9, verses just 1 through 6, we see in the first two verses, Jesus gives disciples power, what authority over demons and diseases, sending them to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. In verses 3 and 5, through 3 through 5, those are instructions for their journey, improvising reliance on God and, and, and hospitality of others. In verse 6, the disciples obey and carry out their mission. In Matthew, so in Matthew, chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. And it says, and when he called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now, the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip, and Bart, Marlow, Thomas, Matthew, the task collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Libius, whose surname is Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. So the 12 were similarly commissioned, de detailing their names and improvising their mission to the lost sheep of Israel. They're supposed to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, right? So theological understanding. The sending of disciples with power and authority signifies the extension of Jesus' ministry through his followers, improvising the continuation of his work. As we closed out in verses 7 through 9 here in Luke, it's talking about Herod, right? So... Herod's perplexity in the beheading of John the Baptist, right? So Herod hears about Jesus, and he's what perplexed, wondering if he is John the Baptist who had risen from the dead. This Herod is the same ruler who later encountered Jesus during his trial, right? Luke chapter 23, verse 7, right? He is also the son of Herod the Great, who ordered the massacre of all the infants in Bethlehem, Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. Mark chapter 6, verses 14 through 28, it gives us a detailed account of John the Baptist's beheading, ordered by Herod after Herodias' daughter requested it. Theological understanding. From Herod's point here in the in his sphere, highlight the spread and impact of Jesus' ministry. The connection to Herod's family shows a, continu a, a, a continuing of opposition to God's work. Herod's eventual role in Jesus' trial improvises the political and spiritual conflict surrounding Jesus' mission, if that makes sense. This study here revealed the interwine nature of faith, healing, and mission in the gospel's narrative. The detailed comparisons highlight the unique contributions of each account, enrich enriching our understanding of Jesus' ministry and his profound theological implications. All right, the new to the Old Testament. Right here, starting in numbers. So I'm gonna go ahead and kind of break this down a little bit. And so I'm going to read, read verses 25 through 27, and it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Count up the plunder that was taken of man and beast. You and Eleazar the priests and the chief of the fathers of the congregation, divide the plunder into two parts between those who, who took part in the war, who went out to battle, and all the congregation. So, As we'll see as we finish out Numbers 31, the Israelites engage in a battle against the Midianites, as God commands. Following the victory, there is a detailed process for dividing the spoils of war, which include livestock, goods, and captives. This passage instructs how these spoils were to be allocated among the warriors, the community, and also the Lord. So the vision of spoils, right? That's what we're reading now. So those first two verses we read, command to divide. The Lord instructs Moses and Alazar the priest to take inventory of the spoils and divide them equally between the soldiers who fought in the battle and the rest of the community. Verses 28 and 30. And a levy of tribute for the Lord on the men of war who went out to battle. One of every 500 of the persons, the cattle, the donkeys, the sheep, take it from their half and give it to Alazar the priest as a heave offering to the Lord. And for the children of Israel, half you shall take one of every 50 drawn from the persons, the cattle, the donkeys, and the sheep, from all the livestock, and give them to the Levites 
who keep charge of the tabernacle of the Lord. So tribute to the Lord. From the soldiers have tribute to be given to the Lord. One out, one out of every 500 persons, cattle, donkeys, and sheep. From the Israelites half, one out of every 50 will be given to the Levites who maintain the tabernacle. In verses 31 through 47. Right, it says, so Moses and Alzar the priest did as the Lord commanded Moses. The body remain the booty remaining from the plunder which the men of war had taken was six hundred and seventy-five thousand sheep, seventy-two thousand cattle, sixty-one thousand donkeys, and thirty-two thousand persons in all, of women who had not known a man intimately. And the half, the portion of those who had gone out to war, was in a number three hundred and thirty-seven thousand five hundred sheep. The Lord's tribute of the sheep was 675. The cattle were 36,000, of which the Lord's tribute was 72. The donkeys were 30,500, of which the Lord's tribute was 61. The persons were 16,000, of which the Lord's tribute was, 30, was 32 persons. So Moses gave the tribute, which was the Lord's heave offering to Alzar the priest, as the Lord commanded Moses. And from the children of Israel's half, which the Lord separated from the men who fought. Now the half belonging to the congregation was 337,500 sheep, 30, 36,000 cattle, 30,500 30, donkeys, and, six, and 16,000 persons. And from the children of Israel's half, Moses took one of every 50 drawn from man and beast and gave them to the Levites, who kept charge of the tabernacle of the Lord as the Lord commanded Moses. So the execution of division, Moses and Alzar follow the Lord's command precisely, containing the specific number for each category of spoils and assuring the correct portion are given to the soldiers, the community, and to the Levites. <clears throat> the principle of first fruits and tithing. The tribute to the Lord from the spoils echoes the biblical principle of the first fruits, where the first portion, the first portion of any harvest or gain is given to God as a sign of gratitude the acknowledgement of his provision. You can, we can see like Exodus chapter 23, verse 19 is a good reference. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 through 10 is another one. Support for the priesthood. The allocation to Levites aligns with a broader biblical mandate to support the priestly tribe who did not have an inheritance of the land and relied on the people's offering for their sustenance, right? So Numbers chapter 18, verse 24 is a good Source Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 1 through 1 through 2. So always click on the link and look at the study guide. The division of the spoils ensures fairness and communal support. This principle can also be seen in the New Testament where early Christians shared their possessions so that no one was in need. That was in Acts chapter 2, verses 44 through 45. Right? So recognition of God's sovereignty. The Israelites recognized God's role in their victory by dedicating a portion of the spoils to the Lord, marrowing the practice of building altars or and offering sacrifices of gratitude for God's intervention and blessing. Genesis chapter 8, verse 20 is a good source, and so is Exodus chapter 17, verse 15. In verses 48 through 54, it's going to talk about offering of the captains, right? So there, it's going to talk about the offering of the captains. So voluntary offering. The army officers approach Moses, bringing additional offering of gold jewelry as, jewelry as an atonement. Thanksgiving for the lives of the soldiers who survived the battle. Acceptance and dedication. Moses and Alazar will, will receive the gold, and, and they will place it in the tabernacle as a memorial before the Lord, signifying the people's gratitude and dedication to God. The division of the spoils of war in Numbers 31. It demonstrates principles of fairness, gratitude, and devotion to God. The allocation ensures that the warriors and the broader community benefit from the victory while supporting the Levites and honoring God with what tribute. These actions highlight the Israelites' recognition of God's sovereignty and commitment to his commands. The parallels to other biblical teachings, offerings, and communal support reinforce the timeless nature of all these principles. So Numbers 32, right? So here's kind of a quick overview, right? right? I'm getting a little tired, so let's do a quick overview of this. So in Numbers 32, the tribes of Reuben and God re request to settle in the land east of Jordan River, which is suitable for their large herds of livestock. The chapter details the, requ 
their request, Moses' response and their agreement. The first five verses here talk about the request. Be the request for land, the tribes of Reuben and God. will notice that the lands of Shazar and Galit are excellent for livestock. And ask Moses they can settle there instead of crossing the Jordan to the promised land. Verses 6 through 15, Moses' initial reaction and warning. Moses will challenge, right? In verses 6 and 7, Moses challenged. Moses questioned the tribe's request, taking, asking if their decision will discourage the other Israelites from crossing into the promised land. There's a, you look in verse 14, there's a connection. Let's look at that. So verse 14, you can see it on the screen. So historical parallel, Moses references the early rebellion of the, of the Israelites when the spies discouraged the people from entering Canaan. That was in Numbers chapter 13 through 14. In verse 14, he warns them not to repeat the sins of their ancestors who angered the Lord with the lack of faith and led to 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. There's also a connection to, to 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verses 25 through 26, right? Future consequences. The passage reaccounts the tribes east of the Jordan eventually turned away from God, leading to their exile by the Assyrian king. This connection underscores the potential spiritual dangers of separating from the main body of Israel. Luke chapter 12, verse, verse 15 is a connection. Warning against greed. Jesus teaching in Luke chapter 12, verse 15 about the dangers of greed, the need to guard against all kinds of greed can be seen as a warning relevant to the tribe's desire for good pasture land. The decision should not be driven solely by what material considerations, but aligned with what the will of God. That's what I put. Verses 16 through, so verses 16 through 32. It's going to talk about the agreement, an offer to fight. The tribes offer to build pens for their livestock and cities, for their families, but they promise to join the other Israelites in battle until all have received their inheritance. In verses 20 through 24, right? Moses conditioned. Moses agrees to their request, provided that they fulfill the promise to fight. If they fail, they will have sinned against the Lord. Verses 25 and 27, tribes insurance. The tribes of Reuben and God affirm their commitment to fight with Israelites until the land is subdued. Verses 28 through 32, Formal agreement. Moses instructs Alazar, the priest, Joshua, and the tribe leaders to hold Reuben and God accountable. The agreement is formally established. Verses 33 through 42. Settlement and lead. And then verses 33 through 38 was granting of land. Moses grants the land to Sheon, king of the Amorites, and Og, the king of Bashem, to the tribes of Reuben, God, and half the tribe of Minnesota. Medicine. They rebuild and rename the cities. Verses 39 through 42. Uh, Menace's role. Menace's half tribe also captures and settles in additional territories. Territories. Theological understanding, faith, and obedience. The passage amplifies the importance of faith and obedience to God's command. Moses' an initial hesitation and subsequent conditions stress that this tribe's decision should not undermine Israel's collective mission to inhabit the promised land. Spiritual unity. Moses' concern reflects the need for spiritual unity. Among the tribes, despite the physical separation, the tribes of Reuben and God must remain spiritually and communally integrated with the rest of Israel. Material wealth and spiritual responsibility. Reuben and God's request highlights the balance between material wealth Spiritual responsibility, their commitment to fighting alongside the other tribes before settling in their chosen land exemplifies their acknowledgement of collective duty or personal gain. Long term consequences. The later exile these tribes, you'll see First Chronicles chapter 5, verses 25 through 26, is a cautionary tale about the long term spiritual risks associated with their separation. This historical context improvises the importance of remaining faithful to God and community. Conclusion. The readings here are numbers. They provide a rich narrative about the interplay of faith, obedience, and communal responsibility. The request of the tribes of Reuben and God. Moses' conditions and the subsequent agreement illustrate the necessity of uh, prioritizing spiritual commitments over material desires. The passage with its connections to other biblical teachings and historical outcomes underscores the timeless principles of unity, faithfulness, 
and the consequences of all of our choices. In the, name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's where we'll end. Thank you all again. Hope you enjoyed. Oh, man. Went a little longer than expected. Just to get a quick blessing. I right? love you all so much. Quick blessing. Let's get out of here. Hope you enjoyed this study. Try to make it as thorough as I can. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be merciful to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, now and forever. Sages. Amen. Love you all so much. I'm out.